First, let's have a quick orientation on the location of Eld Inlet, Mud Bay, and McLean Creek. Here you can see uh, Bud Inlet and Olympia on the right side of the map. If you can see my cursor moving there. Uh, Eld Inlet is the next inlet to the west. So here you can see it's labeled Eld Inlet. And Mud Bay is the southern end of Eld Inlet. And it's an ecologically rich estuary where fresh water from Eld Inlet's largest river called McLean Creek mixes with salt water at the southernmost extent of the Puget Sound. You can see it within the oval uh, in the map extending south out of Mud Bay. So these red lines here, that's McLean Creek. Uh, and the mouth here is, is you know, the Mud Bay estuary. Uh, McLean Creek has two named tributary creeks. There's Swift Creek and Beatty Creek. McLean Creek is known for its impressive fall chum run with spawning in all but the very upper reaches of the watershed. There's documented steelhead, coho, and cutthroat trout presence, uh, as well as Chinook salmon usage in the lower reaches. Most of the McLean watershed originates in the capital forest, and that's this area. I know it's probably a little hard to see, but this greenish tinted area, that's all the capital forest here where you can see my cursor moving. Um, most of, uh, yeah, so most of the McLean Creek watershed originates in the capital forest, and it's just this small corner of the capital forest that drains into the Puget Sound. The vast majority of the capital forest drains into the Chehalis River and out into the Pacific. The first inhabitants of Eld Inlet were the ancestors of the present day Squaxin Island tribe. Prior to the Treaty of Medicine Creek in 1854, the inlets of the South Sound were populated by extended families that developed strong alliances with each other over many generations. This is a photo of the welcome pole that was erected in 2004 at an archeological site on, the, on Eld Inlet dating back at least 700 years. In 1833, Fort Nisqually was established by the Hudson Bay Company near the mouth of the Nisqually River. This was the first European settlement in the South Puget Sound region. Settlement of the area by Europeans started in the late 1840s and the 1854 Treaty of Medicine Creek, which ceded over 2 million acres of tribal lands to the US government, further accelerated settlement. Washington territory became a state in 1889, and by the late 1890s, the settlers had begun building oyster dikes in Mud Bay, signaling the start of the commercial Olympia oyster farming industry that would last until the middle of the 19, uh, the, in the middle of the 1900s. And that ended with the collapse of the Olympia oyster population due to overharvesting and reduced water quality. The Mud Bay Logging Company operated a train, which you can see here in this picture, whose tracks terminated north of Highway 101 and Mud Bay Road. The trestle posts can still be seen at low tide. Fast forward to today, and we've conserved 325 acres over six properties in the immediate Mud Bay watershed, along with several miles of shoreline. This map shows the properties, the year they were conserved, and their acreage. It all started with a seven acre conservation easement donated by Marjorie Randall in 1997. And that's this small property here. If you can see my cursor uh, sort of right in the middle of that image. And that was followed by two much larger acquisitions, Triple Creek Farm Conservation Easement and McLean Point Preserve. And those are in the Northern part or the upper part of this uh, aerial photo. Many of you have probably been to Triple Creek Farm where the owner, Ralph Monroe, has graciously hosted many of our summer galas for more years than I can count. And in 2009, we conserved two more properties, the Appleby Conservation Easement and Lower Eld Preserve. And those are down here in the, on the lower part of the, uh, of the map. And finally, in 2009, we put a conservation easement on a small shoreline property that was donated to us by the late Bert and Di Meyer, who were both local musicians. So I'm going to share with you some great stories about some of these amazing properties, starting with the earliest acquisition first. The story of our Randall Preserve is one of transformation. 
When the conservation easement was first donated to us in 1997, the property was in pretty rough shape, as you can see uh, in the photo from 2000 in the upper left corner. You can see a lot of debris, a lot of structures, um, and just kind of a, ne a neglected property. Uh, in 2003, we removed the structures and the debris out by the road and also a tire bulkhead, uh, which was in front of the shoreline buildings. And in 2006, in the 2006 photo on the top right, you can see the planting completed along the road. In 2011, we removed all the structures on the property as shown in the 2012 aerial photo on the bottom left. And in 2018, we opened it up to public access. And you can see the red kiosk roof and overlook trail in the 2018 aerial image in the lower right corner. So in addition to the structures and debris that we removed early on along Mud Bay Road, in 2003, we got funding from the US Fish and Wildlife Service to remove this extensive tire bulkhead that armored the shoreline. So with an excavator and lots of helpers, we got all the tires removed and this lovely wet mess to contend with. In 2008, Marjorie Randall passed away and she left the remainder of the property to Capital Land Trust. So we began the cleanup in earnest with a lot of help from volunteers, including a local celebrity and longtime Land Trust supporter, Ralph Monroe, uh, we made good progress at removing debris uh, from the property, but the structures were in poor condition and located entirely too close to the shoreline. So in 2009, we started working on grants to allow us to remove the remainder of the structures and debris and fully restore the site. In the spring of 2011, we still hadn't had any grants, but we devised a low cost approach to removing the buildings. Yeah, but seriously, we worked with the, with the McLean Fire Department and they were very interested in doing a training burn which allows their firefighters to train in, in real world conditions. They greatly appreciated the opportunity that these derelict structures offered and it seemed like a great way to get them removed. But rightfully so, we got some negative feedback from some of our supporters that led us to rethink this approach in the future. Uh, the downside of burning these structures, well, from this picture, it's pretty apparent, um, you know, there was just a plume of nasty smoke going, you know, several thousand feet up into the air. Um, and, uh, you know, after all the fire was, you know, all the buildings were burned, there was still, there was still a fair bit of just charred remains of things that had to get hauled away. Um, so, you know, it, there, there were definitely some some pros and cons to this uh, to this approach. So when we first started planning for our big restoration effort at Randall, we met with the city of Olympia because they own the property directly east of the Randall Preserve, and that's that area that you can see that um, that orange uh, polygon. That's the city of Olympia property. Um, uh, so we wanted to fill them in on what we were doing and, you know, make sure we had agreement on where the property line was. So we met with uh, Rich Hoy, uh, who works at the city of Olympia over at uh, their Allison Springs drinking water facility. And we proceeded to walk over to the Randall Preserve along the shoreline. And that took us by this old fish hatchery facility that's just east of the Randall Preserve. Now I'd never been down there or I, I didn't even have any idea it existed. Uh, apparently the springs were impounded around 1950 by the owner at the time, uh, Mr. Allison, and used as a catch trout farm. In the 1970s, WDFW leased the site from the Allisons and began raising Chinook salmon for release into Puget Sound for sport fishing. In late 1970, the city of Olympia purchased the property and leased the incubation building shown here to Northwest Marine Technology. And that's a company that specialized in fish tagging research. So in 1999, the hatchery closed down and the last Chinook 
that were raised here were released into the sound. It's not clear to me how long the fish tagging research was conducted here, but suffice to say, um, by the time we visited down there in 2009, the facility was pretty neglected. So as we walked around down there, my colleague Kat Moore and I both looked at each other and thought, wow, this is an amazing restoration project if the city was willing to remove all these structures and things. The site consisted of two lobes of the estuary and the actual Allison Springs, which were entirely sealed off from salmon access by a series of dikes, tidal gates, and narrow culverts. So here, this is on the northern lobe. And if you can see my cursor moving sort of in the background there, this is a dike that, um, you know, that was just, it was a complete fish barrier. So no, no, none of the salmon could get up past that. And here's a dike on the southern side of the springs. Uh, and this was actually the main access. So there's a road on top of this dike. And that's how you got out to that fish hatchery building and, and some of the other structures there. So uh, th these next pictures are just sort of photos of some of the, some of the um, structures that were there on site that were preventing the fish from getting up into the springs. And, and I don't even know what this structure is, but suffice to say, it's certainly not helping this chum salmon that was looking for a place to spawn. Uh, you know, I'm, I'm just, I'm constantly amazed by our ability as humans to mess up our environment in ways that we usually regret later. And the springs themselves were impounded by these large concrete pools. So these, these photos are further up uh, from the estuary and, and they, were, you know, they were just these big concrete pools that contained the springs. So we asked Rich if we thought the city of Olympia would be willing to allow the springs to be restored and he seemed receptive. With final clearance from the city council, we combined both projects, Allison Springs and our planned work at Randall, and together it made for a very compelling project and we were able to get it funded um, later that year. Now, although there were no salmon using these pools due to the lack of access, there was a very healthy population of these little critters, rough skin newts. Now, once we drained the ponds in preparation for demolition, we realized there were hundreds, if not thousands of them in the mud at the bottom of the pools. So with the help of the Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife, the city of Olympia, the South Puget Sound Salmon Enhancement Group and volunteers, we embarked on the Great Newt Roundup. We had to sift through the mud and weeds to find them. And once we thought we had them all, we'd take a break on the shore. And in five minutes, we'd look back in the pool and there would be another 30 or 40 of these newts that, that came out of hiding and slithered up to the surface of the mud. So we'd get back in there and we'd collect another, you know, 20, 30, 40 of them. And we'd get out and we'd take a little break and we'd look back down in there and there would be a whole nother crew of them. So we had to do this multiple times, uh, getting, getting down in there, grabbing them. And anyway, uh, ultimately though, we, we finally felt like we got most of them. And let me tell you, we had a lot. There were multiple of these five gallon buckets of writhing masses of angry newts. And I don't blame them for being angry, but uh, you know, unfortunately chum habitat and newt habitat are very different in what they require. However, I'm happy to report that they all got relocated to a nearby wetland, which offers them great habitat. So this map shows the impounded pools in green and the goal of the restoration project uh, was to provide fish passage to all the ponds and upper springs for, ch for spawning chum and to enhance access to the intertidal salt marsh wetlands for juvenile salmonids. So the, the, the chum were the only salmon that, that were spawning, you know, that would spawn up in these, uh, in these pools. The coho, they, they like to go further up in the watershed, but, uh, even these these estuaries are really important um, important places for juvenile salmon, chinook, and coho to uh, to seek refuge uh, when they're small uh, before they head out to sea. So we enlisted the help of the South Puget Sound Salmon Enhancement Group to oversee the construction and restoration. 
And we also got assistance from the Squaxin Island Tribe, WDFW, US Fish and Wildlife Service, People for Puget Sound, the City of Olympia. And we got funding through the State Recreation and Conservation Office and the Department of Ecology. And I wanna give a shout out to the City of Olympia, who was a great partner and very committed to the project and provided us with important in-kind grant match. So these next photos are just sort of showing the restoration project as it was moving along. Uh, this was that Southern dike, you know, sort of main entrance uh, to the, to the um, facility that is in the process of being removed. Um, here you could see the dike, uh, you know, before it was removed. And this is after. And again, some other random structures. And this, this, this is the, this photo, if you're looking down into the estuary and to my back would be the actual Allison Springs. And there was a dike here as well. Uh, so that was totally removed. The springs are now flowing freely. And here again, you can see this was one of the other large concrete pools that's totally been removed. And uh, the, the water's just kind of bubbling up out of the, out of the gravel and uh, it's fully open at this point. Again, this was a this was a before photo and an after photo. And here you can see these logs and root wads. These are actually anchored into the ground, and they they provide great uh, habitat for the juvenile salmon um, because you know they can kind of swim in there and get um, and seek refuge from you know birds that might be trying to eat them or larger fish. Uh, so this this these root wads are really important habitat uh, in these in these areas. Again this this is uh, a dike before it was removed and then this is that same area afterwards. And these are some sedges that we planted in, in some of these uh, areas where we removed the, uh, the concrete pools. Again, another photo. And, oh yeah. So, you know, every project has to has, have some snafu to put on the wall of shame. And this one, uh, it hangs nicely on my wall. So there was this large pipe coming out of the ground and, and no one seemed to know anything about it, like what it was or, the purpose of it. And when I say large, it was easily 18 inches in diameter. And the lid, which you can see there on the top, bolted on nicely. Uh, it, you know, it was the size of one of those like manhole covers or utility covers that you'd see in the street. Well, we really wanted to remove all of the structures on the site, including this. So I figured I'd just unbolt the lid and, and take a look inside to see to see what it was. And you know, maybe it was just something that it was just a, you know, a derelict pipe and we could just yank it out of the ground using, uh, using one of the excavators. And yeah, I know, I know exactly what you're thinking. It's like watching a horror movie where someone's about to open up the door and you're thinking, don't open the door. Well, I did open the door and it turns out it was one of Olympia's famous artesian wells that I had just uncapped. And because of the water pressure, um, you know, it's not shooting straight up, but you can imagine if you look at that photo and see all of that water coming out of there, there was no way that that lid was going back on. Um, and did I mention that just above the springs, the city has their drinking water facility that supplies uh, water to most of the west side of Olympia. So needless to say, when I got back to my office, I had messages on my phone from the city drinking water folks and the Department of Ecology, and they weren't good messages. Uh, but in the end, it was for the best, actually, because legally unused wells like this one, they need to be properly decommissioned. And if we had removed the access road and left this in place, uh, it would have been impossible to decommission it because in order to decommission it, they needed to bring this big well rig, this well rig, drilling rig down to the site to do the decommissioning. So, you know, it was a, it was a huge headache for the city uh, and it was very, very costly to decommission, but in the end it, it needed to happen uh, and it was the right thing to do. 
Now, there's also this excellent video, which is called Allison Springs Transformed, that you can find on our website. So if you go to our website and then go to where you can uh, get information about our individual properties, if you click on the Randall property and scroll partway down, you'll see a link to this video. It's got some great footage of the restoration, uh, and it also goes into a little more detail. So this image is a before aerial image uh, before we removed the buildings at Randall and before we removed the structures over at Allison Springs. So if you look at my cursor here on the middle left side, you can see those, the remaining houses uh, at Allison, uh, excuse me, at, at our Randall property. Uh, and then also here on the upper right, you can see that main uh, road that that goes over the dike to access the facility and you know that's totally blocked off there now in this next aerial image you can see here on the left uh, all of those buildings are gone on our randall property uh, and we've restored a lot of the you know the the vegetation and it just it looks really nice and likewise over here to the upper right where once there was that dike that went across the uh the estuary and blocked off that estuary. That's all open now. So it's just it's just wide open. And then there was, of course, a lot more work that we did up in this area where the trees are, and, and you just can't see that in the photo. So, you know, one of the most rewarding aspects of this project was seeing the chum spawn in Allison Springs, literally just a month or two after we finished the construction project. So that everybody was just so psyched to see that. It was just amazing to think that after all this time, they were finally able to go up into the springs and spawn. So now there's a very successful chum run at Allison Springs. And each year we have a tour right about this time. Of course, this year we're not doing it. Um, but uh, but that you know the tour we we it's 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 really well attended. People love to come down. We look at the spawning salmon in the springs, and we talk about the restoration work that we did. Uh, and here you can see some future conservationists um, and the main spring with the chum spawning in the gravel. So right there in the background, that is the main Allison Springs, and you can just make out those little gray shapes, and those are all chum salmon that are spawning. Now back to Randall, after we removed the charred remains of the structures and did a bunch of invasive vegetation treatment and native plantings, we decided to make this our first official public access property. So with the help of numerous volunteers, we built a short trail loop, um, a kiosk, which you can see us building in this photo, and we installed some in interpretive signs. And in 2000, uh, 2018, we had our grand opening. And if you haven't been to our Randall site, I hope you'll stop by. And if you go in the late fall, you'll definitely see numerous bald eagles up in the trees that are taking a break from gorging themselves on the chum over at Allison Springs. So very cool site. Now I'm gonna talk briefly about Triple Creek Farm Conservation Easement and uh, the McLean Point Preserve. And just for orientation, if you look in the upper portion here of this aerial map, you'll see uh, Triple Creek Farm, and just to the south of it, directly adjacent, um, you'll see the McLean Point Preserve. So Triple Creek Farm, as I mentioned, is the home of, of Ralph Monroe, uh, the former long-serving Washington Secretary of State, and he's he's been a long time and, and really uh, incredible land trust supporter. It's got a mixture of agricultural fields, uh, an Eld Inlet shoreline, and sloughs, and uh, Ralph also graciously hosts our annual summer gala at his farm. So if you've never been, it's a lot of fun and I hope you'll join us. Hopefully we'll be able to have it uh, this August. Sadly, we had to cancel it last year, um, but uh, if everything goes right, uh, we'll be back there in August and I hope that everyone can, can come. Now, another really cool thing about the property is this is the site uh, of an archeological site that dates back over 700 years to the ancestors of the Squaxin Island tribe. And this is a photo of a ceremony in 2004 where the tribe installed a traditional welcome pole. Now, Ralph's work with the Squaxin Island tribe on this archeological site and his support of Capital Land Trust and so many other organizations that do great things uh, in our community. It's really a testament to Ralph's community spirit. 
Now this photo is from the adjacent McLean Point Preserve, and it's of a large blue heron rookery that existed when we first pur purchased the property in 2002. I know it's sort of hard to see, but if you look up at the blue sky, uh, you'll see these black sort of, they look like balls up in the trees. And those are all uh, blue heron nests. And if you've never been to a blue heron rookery when they're um, you know, when they're hatching their eggs, it is a raucous scene, let me tell you. There's so much noise and squawking going on, it's, it's really amazing. Unfortunately, um, the herons have since moved on due to predation by raptors. It, it almost seems like raptors, they start to know where the, where the heron rookeries are after a couple of years and, and they'll, they'll come in and um, terrorize the, the herons for sure. So finally, I'm going to talk briefly about the Lower Eld Preserve at the mouth of the McLean Creek Estuary. And just to orient us, uh, if you can see my cursor moving at the very bottom, that this is our Lower Eld Preserve. It's 58 acres. And this is such a captivating property for me because it was never developed and has a very primeval feel to it. It's really one of the few wild places left uh, on in Mud Bay and on Eld Inlet, as you can see. So it's, it's this area, if you can see my cursor moving here in the foreground, it's this area with all the trees on it. So that's, that's our um, lower Eld Preserve with all those trees. And out here, you can see this point of, with salt marsh. It's, it's really a, an amazing property. And in fact, the first time we went out to the property, um, because it's so difficult to get to, we went by kayak. And this is a photo of Kat Moore, uh, who was my mentor at the Land Trust. And some of you may remember her um, from back in the day. The property has the most beautiful salt marsh grasses of anywhere that I've seen. It's, it's really just amazing. Um, and it also out on that point in the, in the salt marsh, it's, there, there are several of these large vernal pools and there's lots of bushwhacking to be done through some fantastic forested wetlands. And my favorite spot on the property is a grove of cedar trees where the bears come and mark their territory as you can see in this photo. And this is a big tree and those claw marks are easily wider than my hands. There's also an old pear orchard that the bears love to visit in the fall and gorge on the ripe pears. And here's a bear that we spooked from the pear orchard and it's walking across to the west side of Mud Bay. Uh, I'm sure not too happy with us at having to uh, slog through the mud and, and swim across the, um, the estuary. But um, yeah, it was really cool to see that. Uh, and there's also uh, a herd of elk that visit the property in the winter. They come out of the capital forest uh, and graze in the grass there uh, during, during the winter months. Uh, this photo is from the property directly across the inlet from our lower Eld Preserve. And sadly, this beautiful bull elk was poached on our lower Eld Preserve shortly after this photo was taken. Fortunately, the poacher was caught and the case went to trial. Um, I actually got to go and I was a witness um, and the poacher was convicted. Um, now, after the trial, the WDFW enforcement officer called me and he said, you know, we, we, we've got this Mac round, the, the rack was mounted because it was evidence at the trial. So it was sitting there on this evidence table. And afterwards he said, you know, we're just gonna put this in a warehouse and it's gonna collect dust. Would you guys like to have it? And so I said, well, yeah, okay, sure. And, you know, just to be clear, I'm, I'm not a, a put dead animals on the wall kind of guy, but I felt like it was a fitting tribute to the majestic animal and a reminder of why we do the work we do. So it now hangs on the wall in the office that I share with Tom. And let me tell you, it, it is huge. It barely fits in our office. And I have to take care not to poke myself when I water the plants that are underneath it. And in addition to these large iconic animals, there's also a host of other wildlife that uses Mud Bay. We've estimated over 130 bird species covering migratory songbirds, shorebirds, ducks, and raptors. Here you can see the bald eagles that line up to get at the spawning chum uh, in the trees right along Highway 101. 
And you know, every year people send me emails of how many eagles they've seen in the trees along Highway 101. Um, I think the highest count was somewhere in the 30s at one sighting, like maybe 38 or something like that. I mean, that's just amazing. I mean, even in this photo, there's there's easily 10 um, bald eagles just just hanging out in those trees, taking a break. So in wrapping up, uh, I want to introduce you to our latest project on Mud Bay, which will conserve 45 more acres contiguous to our existing preserve. We've already purchased 30 of those acres. Here, if you can see my cursor moving these two orange rectangles, uh, that's, that's 30 acres, it's 20 acres and 10 acres, um, and, and those we've already conserved. Uh, and then sort of towards the middle of the map, um, you can see this long, narrow, um, orange parcel. That's a 15 acre parcel. And we are, uh, we should be wrapping that up uh, by the end of December. So I hope you enjoyed this presentation. I want to thank you all for tuning in. Um, and I'll be happy to answer any questions that you have at this time. <laughs>